Good evening and welcome to Science Gallery Bengaluru's exhibition season contagion. This is our public lecture series. For those of you who are here for the first time, we are a public institution for research-based engagement with science. Uh, science for us includes both the human and the natural sciences. Contagion is our first, first fully online exhibition season. We've had three exhibitions before this, two of which were physical and one was also online because of the pandemic last year. I am very happy to uh, welcome a colleague and friend Achal Prabhala today. Today's lecture is supported by the Indian National Science Academy who have supported our public lecture series. Achal's lecture is entitled everything you wanted to know about non-Western COVID vaccines, but were afraid to ask. We are also particularly pleased to have with us today Vasan Sambandamurthy, CEO of the India Alliance, the DBT Welcome India Alliance, and Vijay Chandru, co-founder and chairman of Strand Life Sciences and a professor at the Indian Institute of Science. He's also a member on the board of directors of Science Gallery Bengaluru. Vasan and Chandru will be responding to Achal's lecture. Achal is a public health activist and coordinator of the Access IBSA project and a fellow of the Shuttleworth Foundation. The Access IBSA project is a tricontinental project set up to expand access to life-saving drugs in the developing world, especially India, Brazil, and South Africa. He has worked to drive change in the legal and policy frameworks that have underpinned the development and manufacture of medicines for decades. Over the course of the pandemic, Achal has worked on increasing access to coronavirus vaccines in India and other low-income countries in the world by advocating for intellectual property waivers and transfers of technology, by critically evaluating the vaccine regulatory system, and by examining problems in the vaccine manufacturing supply chain. Thank you all for being here this evening. Uh, just a quick note about tomorrow's programs. We will have a workshop on creating computer viruses with Saurabh Nandekar at 10 a.m. tomorrow. 2020 Vision, Making Sense of 24-7 Online News, a masterclass by Robert Good, who is exhibiting in, the, in, in Contagion. Um, so do go have a look uh, at the website for his exhibition. Uh, and Detect, Investigate, Diagnose, Configure Care in the Context of HIV and Ebola Epidemics, a lecture by Adia Benton tomorrow at 6.30 p.m. You can type your questions in the Q&A box and do also please not forget to give us your feedback because it's important for us to know whether the program is something that you are happy with or if there are things we could do to improve um, what we have on offer. So without any further delay, I'll hand over to Achal. Thank you, Janvi. Um, it's, it's nice to be here. I wish I could say that it was nicer to be here, but uh, I'm suffering from the same thing that every one of you is probably suffering. and so. Uh, my heart goes out to anybody who's been personally affected directly or because of loved ones or people that you know in this uh, truly hellish time. Uh, have a hard time getting through it, just like many of you, I'm sure. Uh, and not just because I work on it, but because so many of us are affected by it on a daily basis. I find that a good day is one on which um, you only get requests for help around oxygen and hospital beds rather than uh, the news of the death. So this is a good time in some ways to explore uh, uh, both the Indian scenario as well as uh, global developments that I think that we haven't taken enough notice of. Uh, I'm Achal Prabhala and thank you for coming. Um, thank you for being here, giving us your time for this hour. I work as a public health activist and I've been doing this for about 18 years. I work here in Bangalore in India, but I also work in uh, Johannesburg in South Africa and Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. And I've been doing this for quite some time now. And one of the things about having uh, a wider view than merely the country that I was born in and live in uh, is to understand the forces that are shaping uh, the pandemic response, not just here in India, but from a comparative perspective in some of these other countries. And I hope to bring some of that out. I'm not going to use slides, and the reason is that I'd rather tell you a set of stories that form what it, I hope at the end of it will be a coherent narrative. And the best way to start that narrative is to talk about where we are today, which is a state of vaccine apartheid. I understand this might sound a little strong, might sound a little like hyperbole, 
but for anyone who has tried to have uh, their parents vaccinated with the second dose, as I did a few weeks ago, it's not a stretch. And why are we in vaccine apartheid? About 20% of the world lives in, in the richest countries on earth. Um, these are the states of the European Union, the United States, the United Kingdom. And in these countries, they're more or less fine. There's still a queue among rich countries with Canada and the European Union somewhat at the end of that queue and the United States and the United Kingdom at the top of that queue. But if you're at the top of the queue, what you have is a society in which over 30% of your population has been fully vaccinated. Uh, between 50 and 60% have received at least one dose. Your economy is surging, life is returning to normal. The kinds of issues that you're talking about are increasing the cap on indoor dining in New York City from 50% to 75%. The kind of issues you're talking about if you're the, in Europe is what vaccines you will allow American tourists and from a few other countries who've been heavily vaccinated to enter Europe with in order to spend money during the summer holiday, which is a very lucrative economic season for Europe. And this is really perverse, right? Because at the moment where we have military police guarding traffic intersections outside our houses, uh, some very small part of the world is actually cementing very, very apartheid-like summer holiday plans. And this is because they were at the front of the queue on global vaccine delivery. They received supplies earlier than any other country in the world, any, any other countries in the world. They invested heavily in the development and research of these vaccines, but took the products that came out of their taxpayer investments that citizens uh, contributed to all for themselves in the sense that they could have negotiated contracts where some of uh, the other countries that depended upon the largesse of the United States or the European Union could have been allowed to manufacture the same vaccines for the vast sums of money that were thrown at them, uh, but they did not. And in, it's now widely agreed that they blew the chance to vaccinate the world. Then we get to about 50% of the world that lives in the poorest countries on earth. These are about 92 countries and together they form about 4 billion people. Uh, India is one of them, we're a low, we're a low uh, middle income country, and then there are low income countries. Now in the low middle, in, now in this group of 92 countries, um, there were two Western vaccines that were licensed, uh, both to the same company in the same country, the Serum Institute in India. One of those has come to market, the AstraZeneca vaccine, and that has largely driven vaccinations in actually all of these 92 countries. Uh, famously, since about March, India stopped allowing the export of vaccines. And it's important to clarify here that these were not India's vaccines. So the 500 million people who could have been vaccinated with the 1 billion AstraZeneca doses that the Serum Institute is producing were actually meant for 92 countries, for 4 billion people. Our fair share of them would have been, by population, about 35 to 40 percent. Uh, there was an informal agreement that India would keep about 50% of uh, the Serum Institute supply in this year. But since March, we've kept about 100% of that supply. And that's due to our own incredible incompetence at being able to understand really early last year, when you have a vaccine supply contract that covers 500 million people, but is designed to supply 4 billion people, that could be a problem take eight people who need vaccinations into a room, throw one vaccine at them, and see how they fight over it, which is exactly what's happening now. So serum is being prohibited from sending out of the country doses that were contracted to go out of the country to make up for the Indian government's incompetence at being able to respond to this crisis, especially in the period of time between September and March this year, when there was a relative lull in the 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 actual actually horrific effects of the pandemic that we see today. As a result of this, we have about 3% of our population fully vaccinated, uh, but countries like Nigeria and Ghana, who were promised by the COVAX facility, this sort of philanthropic industrial complex consisting of the World Health Organization, Gavi, the Vaccines Alliance, um, and, a, and a very oddly named organization, which if you haven't come across 
uh, uh, you should you should look into the Coalition for Epidemic uh, Preparedness Innovations or CEPI. What they promised these countries was that they would take care of them. What they revised that promise to towards the end of last year is that they would provide them at least enough vaccines for 20% of their population this year in 2021. What has happened so far is that we're in the fifth month of this year and they have exported to date a total of about 60 million doses of vaccines, out of which 10 million went right back to India. So uh, around two and a half billion people who live in these other 91 poor countries have received vaccines at best to cover about 1% of their population. Uh, some countries, by the way, including Pakistan, have received no doses of vaccines at all from the COVAX facility. Now, the, uh, the state of the world uh, is precarious because the resurgence that we see here happening in India is something that could happen to any unvaccinated society. And given that we now have 91 other countries who are less vaccinated than us, it would indicate that they are even more vulnerable than us with all the same problems about a lack of uh, a, a decent healthcare infrastructure that can manage even, uh, even mildly symptomatic effects of people who are infected with the coronavirus. We've seen that here and we could see that again in other places that are already hints of that uh, in places as far as uh, Southeast, in Southeast Asia, in, in parts of Sub-Saharan Africa. And you can only hope that something like this doesn't research in the manner that it has in this country. Now, the other 30%, however, uh, of the world lives in what are called middle income countries. Now, these are a curious bunch, right? Um, the, this, this nomenclature, the middle income country is an economic fiction. Uh, it's a thing that essentially doesn't exist. Uh, these are countries with high income inequality, typically, with uh, small groups of very rich people and large groups of very poor people, like Brazil, for instance, which is a middle-income country. Now, the middle-income countries are quite curious because they're not poor enough on average income to qualify for the kind of charity that India or Nigeria or Ghana can. Uh, and there's also not really rich enough to have got ahead of the queue for Western vaccines. And so what they did is turn to Russia and China, which is largely the subject of uh, what I want to discuss with you today, uh, but in connection with the way Western vaccines are operating in the world, the way in which Western countries are dealing with the rest of the world. So what countries like Brazil and Chile, uh, but also Serbia um, and Ukraine and a range of other places across the world, uh, from Turkey to Indonesia have done, is to contract uh, from one of two leading Chinese vaccine candidates uh, manufacturers, uh, Sinopharm, uh, a state-owned company in China, uh, produced a vaccine uh, in their Beijing Institute, which is called the Sinopharm Beijing Candidate, which just received approval, uh, a, a sort of global certification from the WHO, uh, an emergency use listing after about six months of waiting. Um, Sinovac, which is a private Chinese pharmaceutical company, which has developed the Coronavac vaccine, uh, which is waiting in the wings and is due to be approved by the WHO or at least assessed by them uh, later, this, later this week or, or next. Uh, and the Sputnik V vaccine, which was developed at a, a very old respected biotherapeutics institute in Russia called the Gamaleya Center and marketed by the Russian Sovereign Wealth Fund, which is called the Russian Direct Investment Fund. What these three vaccines together have done is kind of remarkable. Um, starting in about August, what they have done uh, to this date is to create a supply mechanism that can put about a billion doses of these vaccines into circulation every year. What they have done is to fill all the gaps that existed that were left by Western vaccine manufacturing uh, control, which limited their ability to supply anyone else outside their highest paying customers. So they've gone to the, all the middle income countries, sometimes with great success, resulting in nearly every adult in the United Arab Emirates or Chile being uh, vaccinated with one of these vaccines. Uh, in the United Arab Emirates, it's Sinopharm. In Chile, it's uh, Sinovac. What they have done is to fill the gaps, not just in middle-income countries, but also in some of the poorest countries on Earth. So the African Union has a standing contract for about 300 million doses of the Sputnik V vaccine. Um, we in India are also, are, also, are also part of this chain in a small way. There are six 
uh, biologics manufacturers and vaccine manufacturers in the country who have been contracted by the Gamalaya Institute and the RDIF to produce the Sputnik vaccine. And if that comes to market in the next couple of months, could be one of the things that eases up the crippling supply restrictions at the moment that have caused our vaccination numbers to plummet. Now, the interesting thing about non-Western vaccines, West vaccines that have come out of places other than the West, is not just the fact that they exist. And it's not just Chinese and Russian vaccines. So we have uh, Covaxin, which was developed by Bharat Biotech right here in India. Uh, we have uh, four different candidates that are at different stages of testing in Cuba. One of those is actually under co-production in Iran. And so the model that the non-Western vaccine uh, makers have followed is very, very different from the Western model. The Western model outsources manufacturing contracts in order to increase supply, but keeps control very tightly of both the intellectual property and the technology so as to centralize uh, the supply of the vaccine. Both Chinese manufacturers as well as the Russian manufacturer, and now more recently, the Indian manufacturer, Bharat Biotech, have decentralized that supply. Sinopharm is being produced at a factory in Abu Dhabi in cooperation with, it's a joint venture with, a, with, with private capital in the United Arab Emirates. And very soon, in the next couple of weeks, they plan to roll out about 200 million doses of the vaccine every month for export because they've taken care of themselves. Uh, the Sinovac vaccine has deals across the world from Brazil to Turkey to Indonesia, where it's currently being manufactured in a limited way, meaning what they do there is fill and finish. But each of these countries has uh, plans to eventually manufacture this vaccine very quickly. Uh, the Russian vaccine is being manufactured right here in India at six different firms, and they're signing up more. I spoke in the course of my work, uh, in the course of reporting on this issue and, and trying to shape some of the ways in which we could alter the Western response to this pandemic to many vaccine manufacturers in the country. And one of them described the process of obtaining a license for the Sputnik V vaccine as sort of open access. He described it like Linux, which is incidentally the operating system I use, which means in a way that any qualified manufacturer who chose to apply to make the Sputnik V vaccine would have possibly been granted a license is what he was implying. And this is a really, really interesting model. You know, we don't think of Iran as a vaccine manufacturer. We don't think of Kazakhstan as a vaccine manufacturer, but it is and it's producing vaccines right now. It's producing the Sputnik V vaccine. Now, the most interesting thing about these vaccines and when I started getting interested in them is about last year when they were launched, especially in Russia and China, prior to the start of phase three trials for efficacy. And there was very bad press around them, not just in Western media, but in Indian media as well. And what it underscored that journey I finally wrote about them in February. And the journey of those vaccines from about August or September of last year until February of this year was one in which I think offered fascinating lessons on prejudice and geopolitics and the way that they can intervene even in the most dire global human emergency uh, as this pandemic. And I'll tell you exactly what I mean by that. So if you opened up a newspaper, uh, I followed this obsessively. You might not have, and you shouldn't have actually. <laughs> uh, but if you did, the headlines were really incredible. This idea that it was somehow incredibly irresponsible of China or Russia to have put a vaccine into circulation only after phase two results were known um, was slammed, including in the United States. And it's by no means optimal, but it was something that was legal in these countries. And it is less awful than it sounds. So at the end of what are called phase two trials on vaccines, you have good data on safety in humans, and you have an indication of what the potential efficacy might be through uh, immunogenicity, which is uh, uh, an early signal of what potential efficacy could be. So with the knowledge that the vaccine that they had, the vaccines they had rather, were relatively safe and were promising in terms of future results to come, they were put into circulation in two countries which did have a, a burgeoning pandemic and a burgeoning rate of infections that they needed to control with, in, an, in the absence of any other option. So there were no Western vaccines on the market in August or September or October, uh, when China and Russia put out 
these vaccines in their countries under limited use. But it was heavily, heavily criticized and that stigma somehow surrounded these vaccines right up to the end, even though the end for the Sinopharm vaccine actually is approval by among the most, uh, among the most globally acceptable norms that we have, which is the, the pre-qualification process at the World Health Organization, which is something that very few uh, vaccines uh, are capable of, of uh, of crossing. And in fact, Sinopharm is the first non-Western vaccine to have crossed that hurdle. And yet there is sort of a grudging acceptance of the fact that it may work, right? And a part of this is because I think there is some confusion uh, about this idea that you could have good science that comes out of bad states. So I think that Russia and China particularly come in for heavy, heavy criticism because of things that I personally as well feel very, very angry about, the idea that uh, the Russian state uh, heavily discriminates LGBTQ people, or that the Chinese state oppresses Uyghurs. I mean, this is just a fact, and I feel as angry as any of you do. You know, the problem is, however, that increasing that oppression or decreasing that oppression will not affect the efficacy of the vaccine, which is a scientific pharmaceutical product. And I think that there has to be some kind of a separation from what the vaccine is from the worst, the worst uh, excesses of the state. And we could see that in the American vaccines, for instance, which nobody associated with Ivanka Trump, for instance, right? I mean, no one with a, with a work functioning mind would do so. Whereas in many ways, I think the Sputnik V vaccine was associated with the worst human rights abuses that Vladimir Putin and the Russian state uh, seem to encourage. This is a bit of a mistake, but not just a mistake for us, I think a mistake for the entire world. Uh, in many Western countries, the vaccine supply was not as planned. And so Canada and the European Union had very rocky rollouts of vaccines. They still have vaccination rates that are much lower than the US or the UK, which had uh, first dibs on supply, in part because they made deals with vaccine manufacturers located inside their borders, and because they invested very heavily in the research and development of things like the Moderna vaccine or the J&J &J vaccine, and in the UK's case, the Oxford and AstraZeneca vaccine. And so the idea of having more options on the table, which is something that would seem like perfect common sense to any country, uh, regardless of what position you are in with vaccine orders, uh, seems to have missed most of the world, uh, especially the rich world, but not entirely, only the rich world. Um, the, the, the interesting thing is that right here in India, we suffer from a debilitating lack of vaccines at the moment, whereas for reasons that I think we can explain, uh, we are engaging with the Sputnik V vaccine, which is great. We're not engaging with either Sinopharm or Sinovac, and it's mysterious because these are about the only two vaccine suppliers anywhere in the world right now that do have some vaccine product to ship. They're not far away at all as looking at a map will confirm, but also as looking as a, at a map will confirm, the reason we're probably not doing that, the reason we're probably not talking to either Sinopharm or Sinovac or that private companies aren't is because of the fact that we're locked in some deadly dispute over a small lake in a frigid mountainous region where as far as I know, at least, and I can understand human beings and, and probably animal life as well has avoided trying to live in for the last 2000 years. And so this doesn't fully make sense. You know, when, you have now about half the supply of vaccines that we had a month ago, and there are two perfectly good suppliers around the corner who would be able to supply us. We seem to pretend that they don't exist, that these vaccines don't exist in the world, that China doesn't exist in the world, and that there isn't a potential solution lying right around the corner that we could use. And I think this is egregious. This is a particularly harsh reminder of the way in which really petty geopolitics and perhaps prejudices and a range of other bad things affect the way in which we deal with the most precious commodity that states are meant to protect human life in this country. Now, it's not, it's not a perfectly clean story. Um, there are uh, differences of opinion in the quality and the safety of these vaccines, but very slightly. So Covaxin, the, the indigenous Indian vaccine, for instance, was recently rejected uh, to be supplied in Brazil by Brazilian regulators on the grounds that there were lapses in the manufacturing practices. Now, 
this is it's important to underscore that this does not necessarily mean that covaxin is unsafe it does mean however that the brazilians found on the same criteria that the cdsco which is the indian drug regulator uh, assessed the bharat biotech factory that there were steps around validation around rechecking that were not carried out in the manner that they should have been and the problem here is that the indian regulator doesn't actually release any information so any information that we have about the fact that bharat biotech might not be taking as many steps as it needs to to ensure and double check the safety and the quality of their vaccines that comes from anvisa in portuguese in brazil and that's really a bit absurd so the cdsco has had i think such a minimal role but has also been so used to getting away with not communicating anything at all all other drug regulators release copious amounts of information especially in the pandemic so the fda in the united states which is the food and drug administration has actual live hearings every time the pfizer and the moderna vaccines were approved for instance they released unprecedented amounts of data not the entire dossier that they received but a very large amount of it uh, to discuss that with people who are interested in doing so the companies themselves released protocols and a range of other data that they normally wouldn't to its credit bharat biotech has peer reviewed studies not for its phase 3 results but for the other phases um and we have an indication from our indian drug regulator that they've assessed the vaccine and its factory and found it to be fine but we need an explanation uh drug regulators can revise opinions but they should provide us at least with an explanation of how they view the faults that were detected in this by the brazilian regulator similarly we have a dispute over the quality of the sputnik v vaccine the and it's not clear what the dispute is exactly but the issues that the brazilian regulator again raised were around the batches that they received of the sputnik vaccine and the possibility that one of the adeno viral vectors which is the technology that sputnik v is built on was um, was live and could replicate right now it's not clear whether this was a endemic problem or a problem with the batch that was received but all we have from the indian drug regulator is an approval prior to the brazilian rejection all we have from the indian drug regulator is silence after the brazilian rejection which doesn't inspire confidence because none of these things mean that the vaccines themselves are bad what it does mean is that our drug regulator should understand that they're in a nation of adults who are interested in these issues and concerned about them and want to know a little more so there are reasons to step up regulatory oversight especially in countries like india and there are reasons to cooperate and work with other countries especially these middle income countries who typically have uh far more rigorous assessment authorities like in turkey or in brazil so there is work to be done and it's not a clean story but the interesting story about this is that i related in the context of discussions that i'm having at the moment for instance in uh, the united states around a trips waiver a waiver of pharmaceutical monopolies in the pandemic which was floated by the south african government with india as a junior partner back in october and which the biden administration finally uh I'll try to put this correctly agreed to discuss talks around or something of that kind but it was one of those you know cryptic uh united nations type statements which was an agreement to begin a discussion of seminars leading to talks that would lead to a treaty or something of that kind anyway but they they signaled this and it was met with great jubilation including by me because we had waited six and a half months uh, for them to say something about this but the interesting thing about it is that uh it's premised on the fact that we might not actually be able to use the opening up of uh, monopolies in the vaccine industry because the capacity doesn't exist um it's also premised on the fact that nobody understands that vaccines are protected by two different monopolies one is the intellectual property usually expressed as patents but also uh, another monopoly which is the actual technology of a vaccine and so some of the ways in which i try to talk about this is to think of it as a vaccine recipe which consists of two ingredients and the first is the legal rights to make a vaccine the second is a manual a guide to make the vaccine um and so i'm working on technology transfer and looking at ways in which we can ask of especially concerned people in the us administration today 
that they forced companies like Moderna and Johnson and Johnson to share their vaccine recipe with manufacturers around the world, not just in India, but in, in Turkey and in Brazil and, and parts of uh, Sub-Saharan Africa where these vaccines can be feasibly made in one form or another. And the pushback there is always, look, you know, the Moderna vaccine is an mRNA vaccine. It's very complicated. No one else can make this. Um, and it's really interesting because um, one of the funny things about the vaccines, a majority of the vaccines that have come out of non-Western countries is that they are what are called inactivated virus vaccines. So the virus is actually killed. It's one of the oldest technologies in existence. Paradoxically, as a result of being one of the oldest technologies, um, it's also one of the hardest to make because you, what you need is a facility uh, which is prepared for the, the, the handling of these live viruses where toxins or, or contamination or breathing in um, some of these viruses might be deadly. And so the, the kind of facility you need to create a, a supply of an inactivated virus vaccine uh, needs to be certified as something called biosafety level three of which very few facilities. And that's one of the problems actually about scaling up Covaxin, the Bharat Biotech vaccine, because there aren't enough facilities that are ready to be able to make a vaccine like that. And so some of the public sector units which have been given the technology to do so are actually scaling up. But when you go down the line of technologies from old to new, it actually doesn't get harder, but easier. So the, the, the middling level technology is the adenoviral vector technology which the Johnson & Johnson vaccine uses, the AstraZeneca vaccine uses, and the Sputnik V vaccine uses. And one of the interesting things about it is that we have dozens of companies in India who make biologics, which is a category of complex pharmaceuticals that technically includes vaccines. And many of these companies, even though they've never actually produced vaccines, because they make a very uh, a vaccine adjacent pharmaceutical product can easily do so and have actually bid to do so and are currently engaged in doing so with Sputnik V. Um, companies such as uh, Stellis right here in Bangalore, companies such as Virco in Hyderabad, a range of other companies had never made vaccines before and are entering that market with the Sputnik V vaccine because of their prior expertise in adjacent pharmaceutical production. And then you have the mRNA vaccine, which is the platform which you've certainly heard of, uh, which uh, Pfizer and Moderna are based on. There are other mRNA vaccines in development elsewhere, including India. The really interesting thing about them is that, yes, they've never been made before, but they've also never been made before in the United States and Europe until March of last year. And as a result of that, uh, I think that there has been a manner of speaking of them as though they really only can be made in the facilities they are being made in right now and in specifically that quantity. But the interesting thing about them is that they are not uh, products that involve biology and they are products of chemistry, meaning that the older vaccines that we use have the squiggly things that we think of the viruses and the proteins which have to be cultivated and grow. This takes time and this takes effort and neither the time nor that effort is required in the mRNA production chain. As a result of it, the, the, they are easier to make. They are faster to make. Now, they are, also, they are also being made for the very first time as a result of which it's not like people can just wake up and produce them. But within this country, our colleagues of mine and I have been speaking now to, I think, over a dozen pharmaceutical companies that simply make injectable drugs and have a history of doing so. And all of them have expressed both a willingness and some degree of capacity to engage in mRNA production with assistance, right? Uh, so as long as there is somebody who can provide just the basics of the, uh, the process and the, the manufacturing chain, they're really eager to take it up because this is something they can actually do without experience in, these other sort of complex biologics that is typically the threshold uh, to, uh, that we require in order to produce vaccines. And so in a very, very funny way, the non-Western vaccines, which rely mostly on the oldest vaccine technology are actually the hardest to make and scale up. Whereas the newest vaccines, which are being sold as the most complex technology are potentially the easiest to expand and scale up, which is why for instance, all, American public health activist efforts are on getting the Biden administration to simply build 
a range of different mRNA production facilities around the world, especially in areas which have never had any manufacturing capacity. But we have a lot of it. There are other countries which have a lot of it. And in the pandemic, there's been this unprecedented understanding of the value of having vaccine manufacturing in your border. And that is, again, thanks to Chinese and Russian vaccines. What countries have realized is that they need, if they can, to be invested in the vaccine manufacturing process close by as a security measure which is why you have these unprecedented collaborations. You have uh, Iranian production of Cuban vaccines. You have the uh, Arab production of the Sinopharm vaccine. You have the Brazilian and the Turkish and the Indonesian production of another Chinese vaccine. You have the Indian production, though with private capital, of a, a government-sponsored Russian vaccine. None of these collaborations existed before. The United Arab Emirates factory that will come online in a couple of weeks did not exist six months ago. Um, the Indian manufacturers who will be making Sputnik V had not ever made a vaccine until a few months ago when they signed a contract with the, the Russians. And this spate of new manufacturing interest in vaccines is something that the Western vaccine manufacturers could significantly take advantage of if they put their technology out and shared it with us in the same manner which is an odd kind of thing to say, because what we're telling the United Kingdom and the United States and the European Union is look at the model that Russia and China have been employing around the world. It's a very good model, right? And this is notwithstanding, let me just say this, the admittedly insane propaganda that is churned out of things like the, the a Sputnik V Twitter account, because of course it has its own Twitter account, um, or a, a delightful publication called the Global Times, which uh, really runs the most insane and honestly sometimes hurtful conspiracy theories around pretty much any other vaccine from any other country. And I think they're especially incensed when they are in this kind of intra-developing country competition. And so they do very much uh, try to uh, uh, you know, throw mud at the Western vaccines as much as they can, but they lose no opportunity to do so at the Cuban vaccines or the Indian vaccines, which they see as you know, somehow even closer to home. Um, Admittedly, so even with all of these problems, the model of manufacturing, of sharing technology, of setting up these uh, co-productions across the world is exemplary. And, and really that is the same kind of model that Western vaccine manufacturers should follow, that Western government should follow. But non-Western vaccines, other than just a credibility issue, you know, I think that there is this idea, we talk a lot about monopolies in vaccine technology, in terms of patents, in terms of the technology, and I think we ignore the monopolies of the mind in some way, which are that we can't fully understand yet. I think, and by we, I mean everywhere, everyone everywhere, right? From the United States to Botswana, to Pakistan, to India, can't really fathom the idea that you could have globally useful science that comes out of a place other than the West. Survey after survey has confirmed this, but there's also an enabling infrastructure that makes it harder to, and so take the World Health Organization, for instance. So, they have taken now about seven months to assess the Sputnik V vaccine with no conclusion in sight. For Sinopharm, it's been about six months. They've assessed it, they've approved it. Sinovac, also six months, still under approval and assessment, right? Contrast that with how long it took them to approve the Pfizer vaccine, 10 days. Uh, with how long they, it took them to approve AstraZeneca and uh, the Moderna vaccines. You know, weeks after they had been approved by one or other European or American regulator, they were approved by the World Health Organization. It functions on a, I guess, a sort of 1940s, mid 20th century paradigm of the world, right? Where it either came out of the West or it didn't exist. And so as far as the WHO is concerned, what they call stringent regulatory authorities, the United States, the UK, Canada, Australia, Europe, are the only authorities that matter. So if they say something works, the WHO is willing to almost rubber stamp the decision. However, if other equivalent regulatory authorities, I'm not even talking about India here, right? But I'm talking about countries like Brazil, I'm talking about countries like Turkey, which on several different international assessment fora are actually rated in the same way as the European agency or the Canadian agency, even if these countries have approved a vaccine, it doesn't mean anything to the WHO. It doesn't change its process. There is no cooperation necessarily between the World Health Organization and these countries. 
And that's absurd. It's absurd at any time, but it's absurd, especially in the pandemic and in 2021, right? So there is a way that we can all do something to be able to shift this idea that innovation and pharmaceuticals that save our lives and vaccines can only come from two or three capitals in the West. And the more we rely on that, the less actually we can do for ourselves. I mean, the more we're hurting ourselves as a result. And it's not, of course, just an international problem. The geopolitics and the prejudice ex exist deeply, deeply, deeply at home, as evidenced in our seeming blindness to the fact that there are two very effective, viable Chinese vaccines that exist around the corner from us, which even in dying desperation, well, we refuse to acknowledge or engage with. I'll stop there. I look forward to the discussion. And thank you. Thank you for being with me. Thank you very much, Achal, for that um, clarity and for a provocative lecture. I am quite certain that our audience has enjoyed it. I would now like to invite uh, Vasan Sambandamurthy to give his comments, brief comments on Achal's uh, propositions. Vasan is passionate about global health, development of affordable healthcare via partnerships and active engagement with society. He comes with over 20 years of professional experience in vaccine discovery and drug development. He has worked at major global corporations like Novartis, AstraZeneca, and Biocon and held senior leader positions in, the, um, in these uh, places. It's provided strategic directions, orchestrated major business operations to develop affordable medicines across multiple therapeutic areas, including oncology, diabetes, infectious diseases, specifically uh, tuberculosis and malaria, and inflammation. Basan, please take over. Thank you, Janvi, for this opportunity. Achal, I really liked your articulation. You made a very compelling case in terms of how the world is divided in terms of quality, right? I like to start with the statement is nobody is safe until everyone is safe. That is the prevailing thought and that is the truth, which is important as humanity is grappling with the pandemic, right? Having said that, there is definitely, a, I would call a very systematic uh, kind of a campaign to have a narrative which shows that vaccines from some parts of the world are not really up to the mark. Having said that, the entire science of vaccine manufacturing is deeply rooted in science and it has very stringent regulatory process as well as process checks in place. So it's very important that no vaccine manufacturer in their, in their normal sense would want to tarnish their image of credibility. As all of us know, vaccines are the most important output from science in the last 50, 60 years, which has really saved humankind to a large extent. So there is a lot of hope, confidence, and faith in vaccines across the world. So it's very important that no vaccine manufacturer would want to let go of that credibility what they're built in. Having said that, I think you articulated very well in terms of how do we go about dealing with, I think there is a lot of spare capacity in the world. And as you rightly, what you call segregated, there is a bunch of vaccines which is heavily dependent on chemistry, like the mRNA vaccines where a lot of countries outside US and Europe have the know-how to make nucleotides or oligonucleotides. And any facility in the world which can make a sterile injectable preparation, which is sold in their country as well as in the Western world, can actually be converted into a vaccine manufacturer except for those vaccines which are heavily biological dependent, biology dependent, like a whole cell inactivated vaccine, which has been the bedrock of a lot of successful vaccines in the past. I think the, the infrastructure required as well as the kind of stringency needed in terms of safety, biosafety, calls for a, another level of sophistication. So I think there is enough capacity in the world to really be opportunistic the need of the R is to have a global, global leadership in terms of how do we go about creating more capacity, more vaccine manufacture and equitably distributed across the world. Even though we have agencies like COVAX created, I think they still need to do a lot of work in terms of making this a reality. Rather now it's happening in a very small proportion, 
but to increase it, we need partnership. And we clearly need agencies like the World Health Organization to play a, a leadership role in creating that sense of responsibility, a sense of ownership, as well as respect among vaccine manufacturers. Thank you, Hassan. Um, I, I maybe uh, I, I could I could respond, uh, but I think that maybe uh, Janvi. Uh, um, could we uh, probably Chandru. just yes? Let's get Chandru's response as well, and then uh, we'll give you a few minutes to respond before we go uh, for the full-on Q and A with the audience. So uh, allow me to welcome Vijay Chandru. Um, as I mentioned, uh, he's on our board of directors as well. But apart from that, he's he has taught and conducted research in computational mathematics of optimization, geometry, logic, and biology at Purdue University and the Institute of Science as well. Uh, he's an academic and an entrepreneur and has co-authored a book on computational logic and edited several volumes and published over 70 peer-reviewed research papers. He was elected a fellow of the Indian Academy of Sciences in 1996, uh, one of the very young ones at that point. Uh, and Chandru is the founder of Strand Life Sciences, a computational biology company and of the Association of Biotech-led Enterprises, which is ABLE, and continues to serve in these um, in executive and advisory capacities. May I invite you, Chandru, to comment on Atil's um, compelling case as well as provocations. Um, thank you, Janvi. And um, like Vasan, I think I would like to begin by uh, appreciating Achal's uh, extraordinary articulation of the issues uh, related to the geopolitics and uh, and the technology uh, innovation uh, in um, in vaccines. Uh, let me start out. Uh, you know, I guess the one affiliation you didn't mention in introducing me is that I'm also now a commissioner with the Lancet Commission on reimagining India's health system. And so obviously, you know, we've had a number of discussions around many of these issues. And let me um, just uh, start off with a position that uh, I think we all need to take, which is that vaccination is a public good. And uh, in some sense, it has positive externalities, of course, and uh, probably does not do well with market mechanisms. And so if we begin with that position that, uh, you know, that vaccination should be thought of as a public good, I do think we would see uh, things very differently, right? Um, I would also like to point out that I'm really worried about the procurement policies that, uh, that we seem to be following now with requiring the states of the country to, to be involved in procurement. I and mean, these can only lead to all kinds of discrepancies between states and and uh, you know, and we, we will see a lot of challenges because of that. It would have been far more sensible to actually have a central procurement scheme, um, and uh, you know, there would also be an ability to negotiate better uh, if it had been done that way. Um, as to more specific comments on uh, stuff that. Achal touched on, I think, um, I mean, I obviously am delighted that uh, he, he sort of focused this as, a, uh, as an innovation issue, also as, a, um, as an open source kind of uh, issue, with all of which are very uh, dear to, to him, obviously, and, and, uh, and to me. Um, and, um, and I think um, uh, his point, particularly that the mRNA vaccines could be easily uh, manufactured in environments where, um, you know, there is a handle on both the scale up 
as far as injectables and so on are concerned, uh, along with uh, you know reasonably competent biotechnology sector. Um, I think, uh, and on both those accounts, I think India scores well. Um, and I would just like to point out uh, in particular, and I'm sure Sudhir Krishna is listening in, uh, Sudhir group has actually developed mRNA constructs and DNA constructs for uh, dengue uh, vaccines. Um, so we actually have a very strong academic resource that could be leveraged uh, and, uh, and along with you know, the biotechnology scale up capabilities in the country, we could be responding very quickly. Um, I just would like to point out that uh, Sudhir's work with and his team's work uh, on the mRNA vaccines um, has been funded by philanthropy from Mr. Narayan Murthy, which I think uh, is, is very notable that, uh, that he had uh, that vision to support uh, this kind of innovation, which, uh, which I think has come at a, you know, at the right point for, for India to take advantage of. So uh, I, I wanted to make those points. Um, and I hope Achal will, if he hasn't already, you know, pick up a conversation with Sudhir and team on, on, on the science. Um, and, um, and I guess finally, uh, I, I uh, you know, I learned a lot uh, from uh, both Achal's uh, exposition and, in, you know, from his uh, articles in the New York Times and in the Atlantic. Uh, and uh, I'm really, uh, you know, in some sense, disappointed uh, with uh, some of uh, what he has pointed out about the WHO's uh, uh, processes, uh, which have, you know, uh, he was very uh, gentle in saying that it's, uh, they're probably stuck in, uh, uh, in the mid 20th century. <laughs> Uh, you know, mindset, uh, but I, you know, this probably, you know, could be viewed, uh, you know, in, a, in much stronger terms as, uh, as a kind of, uh, um, and, you know, an imperialism that, uh, that exists in, in, uh, and which really shouldn't be slowing down uh, our ability to, uh, to address uh, this pandemic. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, I'd like um, uh, I'd like to share with with the panel here that we did invite, in fact, Sudhir to uh, participate today in the discussion as well as comment on uh, um, Achal's uh, Achal's presentation, but also share with us, you know, the work that he's been doing, especially with colleagues in Kenya. And uh, if the opportunity was there to also invite his colleagues from Nairobi to speak with us, but for uh, logistical reasons that was not possible. I, uh, I, I guess we'll all take the message back to him as to why his voice is needed in this debate and why he should be coming to this forum and, and also, yeah. Yeah, and I'm glad you raised the, the Africa issue because that's yes. another passionate issue for Sudhir and I've been involved also in some of those discussions and, and Achal, I think, uh, you know, um, since you are also co-located at uh, Johannesburg, I think it would be very, very interesting to, to, to sort of also look at this whole issue of vaccine manufacturing now developing much more rapidly for yeah. the African continent, right? So, so um, my colleagues will put the links to the two articles uh, written by Achal in the recent past, which um, also uh, discuss what he, uh, you know, what he shared with us today, but also some other other issues are covered there. So you'll find them in the chat box in a few minutes. Uh, in the meanwhile, Achal, may I invite you to respond to Vasan and Chandru before we take questions from our audience? Yes, Basan and Chatur, thank you. Firstly, just for listening and for being here and for anyone else who's here. Uh, look, it's an hour on a day on which 
I guess, admittedly, we're all stuck at home, but it's still listening to people talk about Chinese and Russian inactivated virus vaccines. So, you know, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. But look, uh, I think that, uh, Chandru, the last point that you made, there was a point that you made that I wanted to respond to. Uh, well, actually, the first one that you made was around um, vaccines not being good inside a market mechanism. Um, and, and the idea of them as a public good, I think aspirationally, absolutely. But you know, for Pfizer, just one company in particular, vaccines have been extraordinarily good for them. Their largest selling product prior to the pandemic was um, uh, uh, the PCV vaccine. They have a PCV13 vaccine, Prevnar, they call it, Prevnar. The PCV13 vaccine generated $5 billion in revenue a year and was Pfizer's single largest selling pharmaceutical product uh, from about 2012. And this is the company that made Viagra, right? I mean, so, you know, I, I'm just saying in comparison, a pneumonia vaccine generated more revenue for Pfizer than an erectile dysfunction drug, right? In terms of it being its single largest revenue earning product prior to the pandemic. And the revenue again from uh, the COVID vaccine is now projected at $25 billion. So it's done extraordinarily for them. You know, the problem is that it is almost done too well in the sense that that is again, an extraordinary profit incentive to stick with the same market. Pfizer is essentially supplying 20% of the world. Literally, if 80% of the world just sort of dropped off, if there was some cataclysmic landslide and all of the other countries outside of Europe and Japan and the United States and Canada just sort of dropped off the earth, Pfizer's revenue would not change one tiny bit because they're only getting money from the places that they sell to, right? So it is an interesting conundrum. And I think that the idea of a public good I completely support, but there has to to be some kind of governmental intervention to make that possible. Because I think the market, unfortunately, all too easily facilitates um, this supercharged, profiteering-driven control of that vaccine technology, which is essentially what's hurting us. Um, and and, and uh, 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 Vasan, I was so happy that I think, you know, especially in terms of the safety and quality issues, you know, very much I, you know, I share entirely your concerns around them. I very much have those concerns. And I think that is why, particularly in India with the drug Central Drug Standards Control Authority, we need to get them to communicate a little more. It's not even a question of accusing them of incompetence. We literally don't know. I mean, they could either be spending 24 hours looking at these things very seriously or just actually doing nothing whatsoever. But we don't know because unlike any other drug regulatory authority, this one, our own, does not communicate with us in any way whatsoever, except for issuing to us one line statements about yes or no. This is not like a game show, you know? I mean, in a pandemic, people people are genuinely concerned about safety. And in fact, it's interlinked to the credibility of non-Western vaccines. You know, when we were talking about the fact that they suffer from a credibility gap, of course, a lot of that is generated by negative press uh, or Western prejudice or suspicion, but a lot of that is internalized by us, not necessarily on the basis of evidence, but because we buy the same logic that our drug regulatory authority is doing nothing to dispel. You know, it's not the same in Brazil where or Turkey where you know, ordinary people talk about their drug regulator with this immense national pride as being sort of a jewel of the country, right? Uh, which, which I do really think is something that uh, has, has hurt us and will also hurt our ability to say, give us more licenses. Because on the one hand, we have this incredible, nascent, unused productive capacity to make vaccines in the short run, which is genuinely what is required, not just for us, but so that we can release vaccines to all the other countries that depend on us in the short run, right? Uh, especially on the Sub-Saharan African continent. And then we have a, a sort of recalcitrant regulator who either is doing or not doing their job, but no one will ever know because they've never said anything to the world. I, I do find that really puzzling, uh, but thank you both very much. And I look forward to other questions, uh, Javi. Okay, so uh, we have, um... Lots of questions pouring in. I'll start with the very first question that came in when you started speaking very early on, literally in the first 15 minutes from Shahid Jamil, um, who, uh, for those of you who are not aware, is one of the academic advisors to this exhibition season. So Shahid has a couple of questions. I'll read the first one first. Um, your point about separation of science from human right abuses is well taken. Should future vaccine approvals subscribe to EUA after phase two? Or should this be limited only to pandemic situations? How do you see this impacting the future of vaccine approvals? I, I definitely know who Shahid Jamil is. And uh, I, I read uh, your piece in the New York Times recently, and I also read with worry about your resignation. Uh, I appreciate your work very much. Uh, I'm delighted that you're here. 
Uh, I, I'm not actually offering that as a, as a future roadmap for uh, vaccine disbursement. I think what I was trying to do was to explain the small sliver of separation between the way uh, vaccines were handed out by the Chinese and Russian governments initially, and the way in which the emergency use approved vaccines were handed out in the West. And I think what I was trying to explain was the way that it was reported was as a gross human rights violation by a careless state, which did not care about the lives of its citizens. And I think what I was trying to say is that that sliver of difference really is the one or two months that Pfizer and Moderna took to uh, gather interim results from their phase three trials, which also I think was misreported. So if you asked people on the road, which I did uh, briefly, around the Chinese and Russian vaccines and their difference between those and the American approved vaccines, what I was typically told, and these are, by the way, not on the road, but, you know, I wasn't on any road because we were in a lockdown, but people who are in the know were under the impression that the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines had completed phase three trials, which, of course, they still haven't completed because they're still ongoing, right? Uh, and so that idea of emergency use approval on the basis of interim data on the first couple of months of their phase three trial versus just prior to the phase three trial, after phase two data is clear and known, I think that sliver of difference was not fully appreciated. And I think the second thing with China and Russia was that they dispersed those vaccines after phase two trials at a time when no other alternative existed. So there weren't Western vaccines on the market. And if I had to compare that situation with India's situation, which allowed exactly the same kind of disbursement at the same stage of Covaxin, it's not quite as justified, in my opinion, which again doesn't mean that it's wrong because all of these things are allowed under the emergency procedures of each of the countries that did so. However, when we provided that uh, type of uh, recommendation for Covaxin to be used after phase two trials, before interim phase three results came in, it was January and February when uh, the AstraZeneca candidate at Serum was available to us. So it was at a different stage when we had an alternative which didn't require us to do it. And, and I suppose I'm just trying to separate out the difference between different responses, which are more appropriate actually to the occasion and the moment in which they were made, rather than as a lesson for the future in any way. So I'll, I'll share with you Shahid's second question, where he says, in a changing post-COVID world, I feel India would need to invest in three things to retain an edge as the world's pharmacy. Strengthen regulation being the very first one, invest in R&D, not just manufacture, and move manufacturing to other low and middle income countries. What do you think? That's a really interesting provocation. Um, I, I'm not entirely sure about the moving manufacturing part. And I think that there are companies here who have now spent, you know, the better part of 20 or 30 years developing facilities, either for just chemistry, pharmaceutical manufacturing, or for actually more complex biologics manufacturing. Uh, not to mention, you know, the 21 companies who are registered to make vaccines and have been doing so. And I do think that some of that is a little uh, hard to instantly replicate. If we're talking about mRNA vaccines, particularly the US investments in places like Rwanda and Senegal, which is anticipated, it's not announced, but I think it's likely the kind of thing that the US will offer as a long-term aid program. That might be a good solution because those kinds of, uh, that mRNA factories might be able to get up and running much faster. Uh, but certainly it doesn't seem like the world is going to instantly move away from more traditional vaccine technologies. And I suspect that the manufacturing infrastructure is going to be a slightly greater hurdle uh, to be able to move it out immediately. But certainly, in terms of investing in R&D and research, I am with you 100%. Look, this government at this moment invested zero, zero over the last year and a half in any indigenous efforts. And I completely appreciate that many public health activists have problems about you know, money going to these pharmaceutical companies making vaccines and profiteering and so forth. In a pandemic, I mean, honestly, I would prefer that they defaulted on whatever, you know, defense payments for helicopters and guns that the government was paying out all of this year and put that into providing just free money to vaccine manufacturers to come up with something or creating prize funds. There are a variety of ways in which you can cleverly incentivize new research in vaccines. None of those were ever done by this government. I find that incredibly disappointing. Everybody's asking questions in twos. I have the next two questions from Ranjit Kandal Gaukar, who is uh, an artist who's exhibiting in our uh, uh, exhibition as well. So uh, first of all, he thanks you for, the, for, a, for a clear and precise talk. Uh, his first question is, um, impact of um, the prejudices that you spoke about 
on travel. So, for example, does someone who has taken COVID shield have a better chance of getting a visa to a Western country than someone who has taken a vaccine produced in Russia, China or India? And that could be also driving people's behavior. So that's his first question. Do you want me to say the second or do you want to respond to this quickly? Uh, why don't you uh, ask both and I could respond to both. Yeah, ways. sure, sure, sure. The second question is about the pharma monopoly and uh, or what he calls philanthropic capitalist tendencies of players such as the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and what they have enabled. Uh, how would you look at that? Uh, the first question is very dear to my heart. And please let me just explain this. My entire life revolves around three countries, India, South Africa, and Brazil, right? Mm -hmm. I've been stuck here now for a year and three months, very happily with my family. We are thrilled to realize that we all get along with each other. And should we have to remain in a bunker for the rest of our lives, we'll survive. It is a great realization, right? But for a family that is used to being on the road quite a lot, it's also quite a shock. So my first concern about getting vaccinated was, can I use this to travel? Unfortunately, mm -hmm. the only two countries I travel in and the one I live in have the deadliest variants, it seems, in the world. So, you know, my travel is just being pushed out and out further. Uh, so here's the thing, right? I wanted to take Covaxin. The reason I wanted to take Covaxin is because by the time I was eligible to be vaccinated, there was real life clinical trial data in South Africa showing that the AstraZeneca vaccine had very low efficacy against transmission of the South African variant. And it's quite specific to that, right? Because this relates to other misunderstandings about vaccines, but this was just transmission. So it would have still provided you know, some degree of protection against hospitalization and death and so on, but very low efficacy against transmission. So I knew that. I did not know that about Covaxin. So Covaxin was a better candidate. So meaning that you know, at least with Covaxin, it was an unknown unknown. With this, you know, there was, there was some more that was known about it not working. What did I take finally? I took the AstraZeneca vaccine. I took Covishield. Why? Because I thought I might not actually be able to get on a plane without it. Yesterday, I opened up the New York Times. I saw a piece about who will be allowed to vac uh, vacation in Europe. And it's not just Americans. So, you know, the one American who might have taken a Sinovac vaccine will not be allowed into Europe. You have to take a WHO approved or uh, what they call SRA, the stringent regulatory authority approved vaccine in order to be able to spend your money at uh, tawdry tourist sites in Italy this year. So, uh, so it is a mess. If you want to take a vaccine against variants, by the way, I strongly recommend looking at the data on J&J &J and Novavax, which are the vaccines that conducted their phase three trials at the latest stage uh, among the Western vaccine candidates. So they have real life clinical trial data around their efficacy against these variants, uh, both the Brazilian and the South African variant. And the good news is that they work to a very large extent against them, which is really good news, right? And this is not something at the moment, you can say the other, other vaccines have run in vitro lab tests around potential efficacy against the variants, but it's really only Novavax and J&J, &J, which have shown that efficacy uh, to work in real life, which is very good news. Well, the second question, in terms of the philanthropic capitalist system, I do think that there is some kind of delusion that we've been under that somebody who's very successful at making plenty of money, writing very bad software code that I personally have not used at least in about uh, 20 years, uh, would be also then therefore the best person to run the entire global health system. Yeah. So this is not something I fully understand. I do think that Indians are predisposed to understand this in the way that, you know, somebody with a Nobel Prize for physics, and then I see the person on television being interviewed as to how to prevent starvation in the country, right? I think this is wrong. So I think in the same way, we would get we get what we deserve. And so if we did then allow uh, somebody like Bill Gates or the Gates Foundation to be in charge of global public health, we get what we deserve, which is a string of broken promises over last year, especially to the poorest countries on earth, that they would be entirely taken care of in terms of their vaccine need, a little adjusted promise later this year saying, oh, maybe we'll get you 20% of what you need. And then reality, six months into the year, when many of those countries have at most 1% and others have nothing. Yep. Uh, just a quick note from Shahid, where he says it didn't mean moving, but rather adding manufacturing facilities in other do and make And I think you both agreed on that. Um, so there are there, there, there's a there's a pattern to the next questions that I see where uh, so I'm going to read one of them. Why are studies of natural antibodies being totally ignored and new science of newer vaccines pushed as an agenda to be blindly followed? Uh, long term testing of vaccines should be over a period of, say, a decade or so. mRNA is definitely not tested for this. Um, 
you have to agree to that all the rollout of vaccines were according to the new protocol especially designed for this situation um, this is very important in the light of actual long term immunity of t cells and all of this is never mentioned over by whoever talks on the plat on a platform like this one I, I, I'm not sure I fully understand the questions, Janvi. Yes, so let me answer you. them from the what I think I understand. Yeah, about the, uh, you know, one of the things that's actually bugged me about this entire last year is this question of efficacy. And so I'd like, I, you know, I'd like to rant for about a minute on this idea of efficacy. So the first understanding that any of us had about efficacy is when Pfizer and Moderna released interim data from their phase three trials, and they were in the, 90, I think it was 95 and 91 percent, and then everyone was fixated with this idea that. That, that keeps you 95% safe or whatever it is, which is firstly not actually true, meaning that the efficacy number when you translate that into your personal risk of contracting infection, et cetera, is obviously a very different number, which is based on your, you know, which is based on uh, you, what you're yourself exposed to and what your lifestyle is. Now, the the uh, uh, the one of the charges that was lobbed against uh, Sinovac in particular, one of the two Chinese vaccine candidates on trial, was that simultaneously in the space of about two weeks, there were three different trial results, uh, interim results from phase three trials in Turkey, Brazil, and Indonesia that were released. In Turkey, they found that it was 91% effective. In Indonesia, uh, uh, it was in the 70% range. I think it was about 75 or 80. And in Brazil, it was 50%, right? And everyone said, this is a very bad vaccine. It cannot possibly work because here you are, you tried it in three countries and it returned three different results. That in fact, gave me more confidence because this vaccine was trialed by three completely independent groups, not working with each other, totally unaffiliated, who designed their own protocols, ran their own trials, and independently assessed and evaluated the results that came out of it, right? So, of course, it's going to be messy because the protocols and trials were completely different. So the Brazilian trial was run in a COVID ward with COVID healthcare workers who were treating COVID-affected people. So they had among the highest risk rates in the world, right? They included categories like very mild, so that literally if there was a sniffle among the trial participants, they were tested. That was not a category in any other, other Western vaccines. They uh, decreased the ideal dosing schedule that they received information of. So from phase two trials, you, you, you get an ideal dosing schedule where you see the greatest immunogenicity, right? So that's how you design the two weeks or the three weeks that you space between two doses. In Brazil, they decreased that to a week because they just needed to ramp up as much antibody protection to these people because of the risks they faced, right? And they reported all of this, and as a result, also had much lower efficacy results, right? When you look at their ability to prevent moderate to severe infection, it was 78%. Uh, sorry, mild to severe was 78%. Moderate to severe was 100%, though not statistically significant, right? Um, but that mess of these efficacy numbers, what we understand from from them, what we take away from them, and the life-changing decisions that we make on the basis of a total misunderstanding of what a trial protocol is, what a design is, not even knowing what those are, and then comparing these two-digit percentages between all these different vaccines with vastly different you know, trial designs, I think is, has been one of the most catastrophic uh, mistakes in, in reporting science media, honestly, in this last year, to me. Hmm. Uh, another question to which I don't know if I either understand correctly or even whether I should be asking you to answer this question, but since it's come up, I'll anyway share it with you. Is natural immunity better than vaccine-acquired immunity? I don't know if you're the right person to answer this. No, I studied economics and public policy, so I would be great, you know. <laughs> I'd be delighted to give you an answer, but I promise you, you don't want to hear it. Yes, exactly. Um, so... Um, we have 15 minutes between you and the young people who wish to meet you later this evening for a tutorial session. So I will let you um, take a break. So um, thank you so much, Achal, for livening up our public lecture series and making a compelling case, as Vasan said, and for your provocations um, and, and uh, uh, the element of politics that both Chandru and Basan mentioned, and I would like to add my voice to it, So, which, was, which is much appreciated. I want to thank Vasan and Chandru for taking the time to be with us this evening and for sharing their thoughts. Um, the recording of this lecture, as with all the other 22 lectures in this series, will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. So in case you may 
missed any of the previous ones, or if you, for some reason, will miss the next ones, do check our YouTube channel. Um, subscribe to it if you'd like to. Um, I'm sure you enjoyed today's lecture, so please sign up for a lecture by Gagandeep Kang, who will be able to answer many of your very vaccine-specific questions. She's going to speak about COVID-19 vaccines present in the future on Friday, 28th May at the same time, 6.30 p.m. And while you wait for her lecture, you can watch her video, How Pandemics Advance Science, which is a part of our COVID video series. They are about three and a half minutes long. Uh, do check that on the exhibition website. And if I may, do consider watching the film A Human Question by T. Jayashree, which explores the global struggle to make HIV AIDS drugs more affordable. Uh, T. Jashri, who's a film director, will be available for a conversation with journalist Vikram Doctor about the, about the film on Sunday, 30th May at 5 p.m. And do consider signing up for a workshop by Hannah Choa Howard from the Welcome Trust on COVID-19 vaccines, telling the story on Sunday, the 30th May, the same day as Jashri's discussion. Do give us your feedback, do register for future programs and visit the exhibition website. Thank you again for taking the time to be with us this evening to the audience, but especially to Achal, Vasan and Chandru. I very much enjoyed the conversation this evening and look forward to future conversations with you and to having you uh, join us in this journey uh, for public engagement with science. Thank you, Janavi. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for being here. Thank you to the two young people who want to spend 8 p.m. on Thursday, Friday night listening to me talk about Chinese and Russian vaccines. I look forward to that. And do watch Jashi's film. She's a great person and it's a great film. Thank you. It is. Thank you. Thank you Good evening. Thanks, Thank Ashwin. Thank you. Bye, Chandra. Bye, 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 Bye. 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 Bye.